Hey guys, welcome back. It is your favorite Gimple the Limp and I'm here with another special treat for you today. Today we're going to be taking a look at Blood Red Skies and I don't know what camera I'm going with yet. Upper or one in my hand and I've got both running so we'll see, uh, see which angle you guys are going to be viewing this from. Uh, this is a miniatures based uh, aircraft combat game, skirmish game, similar to uh, things like Wings of Glory or X-Wing that you might have seen previously. Now, one of the things that, one of the reasons I'm covering this is it's kind of a good thing and a bad thing. Uh, Blood Red Skies is one that I've wanted to get on the table for a while, and they were gonna come out with a digital version. I, I've been talking with the guy back and forth, we were gonna get involved with it, and unfortunately Kickstarter did not uh, take off as well as it should have. I mean, it was really, really, really looking good. So I hope they bring that back. Uh, but since the digital version did not kick off, I was like, okay, I gotta get the uh, the tabletop version uh, going. So I went ahead and got some aircraft painted. I've got some uh, British Spitfires over here and some ME109s that I've painted up. Uh, first video we're gonna take and do Usual little overview, show you the components, uh, basics of how the game is going to be played. And then the second video, we'll get into uh, some examples of play. We'll jump in, have some of these uh, planes start moving and shooting, hooking and jabbing. Now, when it comes to BRS, Blood Red Skies, this game is all about the advantage, all right? The, in combat, aerial combat, it's all about utilizing your speed and your altitude to gain positional advantage upon your opponent. And that's something that can be hard to simulate in a tabletop game. They've tried it in multiple different ways. We saw in Age of Dogfights how that worked in the previous video series that I've done. Uh, X-Wing doesn't really worry about things like positional advantage. It just worries about getting your, your lasers on target and proton torpedoes and everything, although I haven't got to play that game in a hot minute because of all the other bull crap. But this game, how they signify it, has to do with your aircraft. Now, Age of Dogfights showed the actual altitude. Here, they don't do that. Instead, all the bases, all the aircraft, are gonna be on a single base, but you can take and shift the aircraft back. And I like the fact that these wings are stiff because it makes me think that it'll last longer. All right, so this signifies that a plane is advantaged, all right? So it's in a good position. So think of this as high altitude or fast speed or combinations of the two. At this position, which we are currently at, it's neutral, all right? So this is middle ground, you're, you're coasting, you're ready to go. And then if you're disadvantaged, obviously you're gonna be pointing forward and this, funnily enough, is the only way you can get shot down in this game. Unlike other games, you can't just be shot down in blood red skies. You have to be shot at, one, by someone who's in a better position than you are. So they, um, if they're advantaged, they can shoot at uh, neutral or disadvantaged. Or if they're neutral, they can only shoot at disadvantaged. But a disadvantaged plane, for example, could not shoot at a neutral plane, even if they were in a better position, you know, right there, got them guns pointed at them. If they don't have the positional advantage, they don't have a higher level of the three, then they're not going to be able to shoot. So when it comes to the components, you guys are seeing them now, the uh, the plastic bases I like. Uh, the paint schemes are me. They do come as just regular uh, plastic pieces. The Spitfires were more of a brownish. The ME109s were grayish color, so you could play them just straight out of the box if you wanted to. Uh, but if you do want to paint them, you can. I thought the Spitfires came out okay, roughly. I mean, it was easier to give them this camo scheme. For some reason, I had just the hardest damn time uh, painting the ME109s. They did not work quite as well. But I got the little beige there underneath, hit it with a, a black wash, give it that dirty look. And the ME109, something similar. I think I forgot to wash the bottom. Yes, I did. I forgot to wash the bottom of these. Oh, well, I'll go back and hit that uh, later. But the usual yellow nose cone, yellow tail. Uh, these are stickers, though, for the decal pieces. They're not actual decals, the ones that come with the box. These are the ones that are included, but there are decals that you can get that will look better, won't have this 
uh, cheaper sticker look instead of uh, if you really want to go that high level. I am not experienced when it comes to painting this caliber of miniature. I've painted normal miniatures, crap you're going to find with Warhammer and, and stuff like that. But when it comes to realistic stuff like uh, airplanes or tanks that uh, I'm kind of poking around at now with Company of Heroes, I don't have as much experience. So that's kind of a learning game for me. That's why these came out with very, very basic color schemes. Something that when we're back a little bit, looks good on the table. Uh, other components for the game. The mat that you guys see is actually the same mat that I used with um, uh, Black Seas. All right, so this is the nylon mat that I actually ordered. Just a generic ocean mat, and I figured this would work you know, Battle of the Atlantic type thing um, for our aerial combat here. The game, the base starter box does not come with a mat of any type to play on. That I thought was a little bit of a miss. I would have liked to have seen at least a, uh, a paper mat, you know, something uh, that could be folded, included, just to give you a, a starting way to play the game. It does not have that. If we do look on the back of the box, though, it shows you everything that comes with it. A uh, couple of different rule books, beginner advanced, uh, scenario booklet, six planes of each side. So you've got six Spitfires, six ME-109s, a uh, bunch of dice, I think it's about 10 dice, bunch of cloud symbols, and then the barrage balloon um, icon uh, cutouts as well, cardboard pieces. Uh, a lot of tokens, the, uh, ah, crap, I'm blanking out on the name, burst, the hit tokens, and then tokens to signify whether your plane's gone or not. The turning token, the range, the movement, uh, all that good stuff does come with a handful of cards if you're playing the advanced version, which is really just the, the basic version. It does say on here the fact of everything that is included. Uh, I kind of assumed without looking that it would have, sorry about the little bit of a light glare. <laughs> I got light going in from every direction. So it's like, all right, which direction can I turn it? Um, I, that was kind of on me that I was assuming, and I shouldn't assume on that. Uh, there are a bunch of expansions for the game, so many, many, many different types of aircraft uh, you can fly, paint up, uh, make look good for the table. So very similar to me to X-Wing, uh, not just in the way that it plays, but in... Um, the amount of expansions and how you can focus on just one faction if you want to, that type of play. Uh, I think this would work especially well if you have a group around you that does play. You could get, you know, large historical battles simulated, stuff like that. I think this would really go, uh, go really well for that. It is by Warlord Games, so obviously I do like the miniatures. I think the miniatures are well made. Uh, they are the same ones who did Black Seas, among a few other games. Um, What's the uh, Atlantic Fleet, Atlantic, so I'm blanking out on that one, but the other sea game that I want to try out and get to the table at some point, World War II uh, version, basically, of Black Seas. So they do have a lot of uh, tabletop miniatures-based games, and they do well with it. Boom Chits, and <laughs> I was trying to remember the name of it. What do you call these things? Boom Chits, and since I'm talking about these things, I'll go ahead and tell you. That's what you're going for in this game. That is the uh, the point, right? So when you shoot someone, let's just say you shoot and you score a hit against that Spitfire, they take a boom chit. And it's not the, the plane itself taking the boom chit. It is that side is taking the boom chit. And that's uh, basically how you're going to get your victory. So uh, let's say the, the game that I'm going to be playing here in just a little bit, three planes on each side, something basic. Uh, once you have more boom chits, one more boom chit than you do planes on the board, you've lost. Uh, it doesn't symbolize just your planes being attacked. Your planes can be shot down in this game, but it's not as much the crux of the game as getting those boom chit tokens onto your opponent. So if the Spitfires received a total of four boom chits across all their planes on one plane, whatever the case may be, they're going to lose because they've got too many boom chits. So their planes have started to take a little bit of damage. Their pilots are stressed. Uh, their ammo is running low, fuel running out. Uh, the whole nine. It kind of symbolizes the whole thing. The ME-109s would have got in better positions and outflown 
uh, the Spitfires, they might have lost a plane or two, and the rest of them bugged out because they weren't going to fly just until they died. You know, kind of like how we play our uh, our miniatures games. Uh, they didn't necessarily always fight like that in real life. All right, so besides that, while we're still looking at the miniatures, there are cardboard token pieces that go on the bases themselves. That's what you're seeing there. Uh, not only the direction of the plane, and it gives you your firing angles, so if you did have a plane that had multiple firing angles, you would know which one was which. You know, obviously front for your uh, your fighters, but your pilot skill level, which comes into play with everything with this game. It affects all your dice rolls, all your attacks, your defenses, all that good stuff. I really like that. So this one's level two, backside shows level three. We've got guy here who's level three. And then this one's level four. I put a two, three, and four on each side just to show you guys the basics. It goes all the way from two to five, five being your ace, obviously. So they're going to perform better than a rookie, a, a guy who just got in the plane. He's not going to have as much skill, so he's not going to roll as many dice. It's, it's really that simple. I think they created a streamlined game where the rules are uh, deep enough to give you a, a nice, firm, miniatures skirmish experience, but one that you can sit down, breeze through the rule book, and, and you're ready to play in a matter of minutes. Uh, it actually surprised me when I first read the, the rules, right? Because you can see this thing is not big. The rules booklet, what is this? Small pamphlet size, 16 pages, right? 16 pages. I read it and I was like, okay, is, is this it? This this is it, like I, I must be missing something because there, there's gotta be more rules in this. Now there are the expanded rules and this gets into what they call like the, uh, the advanced version of the game and that comes into the action deck. And we're gonna show the action cards here in this video, but uh, we'll play them a little bit in the game when we start doing the, uh, the combat example of play. And that changes it up. It gives you that deeper experience, but if you want just a base game, something maybe you're gonna play with your kids or someone who's just learning out, uh, you don't have to worry about the expanded rules. You could just worry about the miniatures on the board. I like how they kind of broke that up. It's more of a learning, getting started, and then uh, a deeper version for those who want to get really into the game. And then just to show you, scenario booklet, which does have a few extra rules involved with it. it shows things like the barrage balloons, all that good stuff. And then uh, scenarios later on shown in the booklet where who's flying where, where they're deployed, all that good stuff. Now, if we pan over here, I've got the rest of the components out that we're gonna need for play. And you'll notice there's not many, right? That's There's not a whole lot that you have to worry about with this game, which is something I liked. There's part of the reason I was drawn to X-Wing is the fact that if I wanted to play a game, if you want to play 40K, right? You would show up, you'd have your cases upon cases upon cases. Uh, Lord knows if you had uh, orcs, then you were showing up with a truckload of miniatures and it would take you 30 minutes to put just your crap out on the board. Uh, thing that was cool about X-Wing is you could show up with as few as one ship so if you really, really, really tweaked it out, but usually two, three, four, if you were flying a swarm, it was eight, you know, eight models was the most you could have on the board. So you only needed a handful of tokens, some uh, range rulers, and you were good to go with your few ships on the board. You could carry most everything you needed in one hand. I think uh, Blood Red Skies kind of falls more into that category. You just need the cards that show your uh, playing stats. You'll see here's for our 109. The top stat here is their firepower, one rather weak. And it's very easy to understand what these numbers mean. Firepower, when you're shooting, it is this number plus pilot skill. That's it. So sweet. So easy. So level two, you're rolling three dice. Level three pilot, you're rolling four dice. That's it. Your agility, so how agile the aircraft is. This is a fighter, so it's going to be rather agile. It's a three. Same thing. You take and roll your pilot skill plus whatever this number is. So you add it up and then roll, and then you're looking for the spade symbol on the dice, which is effectively your six. These are six-sided D6s, but they've kind of tweaked them a little bit, make them look neat. 
but the spade is what you're looking for. And that's the only thing you're looking for, for the most part. There's a few rare exception, but for the main part, if you're rolling for attacks, you're looking for these. If you get more than one, it's a critical. It's simple, simple. I really like the streamlined rules. If you're doing a dodge after you've been shot at, same thing, add up the dice that you get, and then bam, you're rolling whatever amount of dice it is, two, three, four, five, and you're looking, hey, did I roll any spades? I did, I succeeded. That's it, all right? Real simple. Uh, modifiers tend to be things like removing dice, so it is easy to understand. Uh, down at the bottom shows your speed. That's how far you move in inches. And that's where your little movement stick comes into play. And I'm sure this game, just like X-Wing and all others of its ilk, you can get uh, the more premium versions of these from places like Etsy and others where uh, it's acrylic tokens instead of the cardboard if you wanna go that route. But you see for movement, I like it. It lines right up, it's nice and curved. So it slots right in and you put it right in there on that arrow, right? And then you just move up, boom, however far you're going. There's your straight line, you know how far you've moved. Really like that, easy to understand. And our range roller is the same. This is six inches. You're just gonna take and look, yeah, if I can get it. And if your little circly base can point at the others within that, front 45 degree angle or 90 degree angle. Yeah, 90 degree angle, <laughs> get again kind of stupid. Hey, look, we got him in range. We could shoot at him, boom. Real, real, uh, real easy to understand. Movement turning is the same way, very similar. Uh, kind of noticing this uh, similarity with Warlord games. Fun games, but stuff that's not too uh, complex to understand, but enough rules to, to really catch your attention. Uh, turning is just going to be whether you're turning left or right, you're going to line up your arrows on your little turning dial there, and then you just rotate the plane. Boom, just like that. You've made a 45 degree turn. You get one of those per movement, unless you do you know, advanced aerobatics, good stuff. And then our other token, if once you've completed a turn with an aircraft, you're gonna mark them. Only other thing it comes to when we're looking at the cards are their traits. We see the uh, 109 has great dive, great climb, just like they did uh, historically. They were pretty good at going up and down. And that has to do with your advanced cards. We'll show these when we start playing, but basically these allow you to break the rules of the game, uh, just like any other card would uh, type card play. Spitfire has the same type stuff. We see here it's got the same stats as the 109, but its traits are where it's going to really, uh, you know, differentiate itself between the 109. The 109 could go up and down easier. The Spitfire has tight turns, so it's gonna be able to turn around a hell of a lot easier, but the 109 might be able to get uh, more advantage using the great dive and stuff. All right, and just to show you a basic sequence, you're gonna have a couple of these in your uh, box as well if you get a starter set and it tells you your activation order and basically what you can do, all right? And then over to the right shows our uh, test, which shooting test, dodging test, trying to avoid getting shot at. Something I find neat about this, and for me, this is something that's always going to affect skirmish games like this uh, when it comes to play, and it doesn't matter what the type of skirmish game is. I do a lot of air skirmish games, a few C ones, but it's all about the initiative. Who's activating when? That's not only going to affect how fun the game is, but whether or not it's going to be able to be sol uh, soloed and whether or not it'll be able to be soloed well. I think this could lend itself to that, but I think the activation for this does lend itself more to multiple players rather than solitaire play. Now, the way this works is that planes are going to activate by pilot skill and advantage level first. So if we had multiple planes here, we've got a two, three, and a four. If this one was two, I'll leave this one at that, and neutral, and we'll tip him forward, all right? So we've got one plane advantaged, one plane neutral, one plane um, disadvantaged. The lowest pilot skills over here to our left, and the highest, uh, highest pilot skills over here to the right. In a game like X-Wing, this guy's still gonna go first, right? But 
In this game, it doesn't work that way. The advantage plane is going to go first and it's going to start with the highest pilot skill. So your aces are gonna go before the others, uh, doesn't matter what faction it is. And then you are rolling between the, the factions who has initiative. We'll get into that when we get into the, the game itself. But general gist, you're going to have the advantage planes go first, highest pilots go first, then your neutral planes are going to go, then your disadvantage planes are going to go. Real easy to understand. One's pointing up, going first. One's flying level, going next. One's pointing down, going last. So that's something you, you really got to consider in game. Wherever you end your turn, your guy might start first this turn, but he could be going dead last on the next turn. And you have to consider that because you do have the ability with pilot actions to take and change your, your advantage level. Maybe it's worth not taking that shot and instead raising your advantage level so you get to go earlier during the next round. So when we look at this, you'll see what I'm talking about. Activation, the first thing you do is shoot. That's a little different from other games. Usually you're going to move and then uh, have a shooting phase later. And this one, you have to shoot. And it reminds you here that uh, the advantage level matters, that advantage to neutral, advantage to disadvantage, neutral to disadvantage, disadvantaged airplanes cannot shoot, right? They can't do that. You've got to be at least at a decent level to be able to take your shots. After you do that, you can choose to burn advantage. Obviously you can't do it if you're already disadvantaged with some minor cloud cover exceptions, which we'll touch on here when we get playing the game. Uh, but you can do that to maneuver, which will give you a up to 180, uh, ah, 180 degree turn instead of a 45 degree turn. So basically you can turn around, right? So get slotted in on someone's six, but you got to dive down. It signifies that you're diving down from height, you're getting some speed, getting turned around, but you're going to be losing that altitude, losing that speed and doing that maneuver. So you lose that advantage, like how that works. Uh, dive, you can add six inches. So our Spitfire here, instead of moving seven, can move up to 13 inches. However, our 109 could play one of his trait, uh, the trait cards here, and instead of doing a six inch move, he could do an even farther move using the Great Dive. That would be one of his little bonuses for trait cards. So you see, you can take and burn advantage to gain bonuses. And really quickly, while we're on the subject, just to address it, what I'm talking about with the cloud cover, these is if your planes fly into a cloud, they automatically become neutral, just flat out, they're neutral. When they leave the cloud, they're still neutral. So at any point you're in a cloud, you're neutral. So you can burn advantage and still leave the cloud neutral and not really have that uh, detrimental effect. So you really wanna burn advantage if you can while you're in a cloud. Uh, for that bonus. You're not going to be doing shooting and stuff while you're in the cloud anyway. So after you do that, choosing to burn your advantage, then you're going to do your move. Your move is whatever your speed is and then up to a 45 degree turn. Now it does list down there below an aircraft must always move at least half its movement speed. That's different from other games. Some other games you don't get a choice like uh, Age of Dogfights. You did not get a choice when it came to how fast uh, you had to move. You had to move your speed. There was rolling involved with that. So uh, you could be going faster this turn, slower this turn, you had to account for that. In this game, you can choose to throttle back a little bit if you want to. So our 109 and our Spitfires, they could go as slow as four inches. So half rounded up, they would be at four inches. Now, the big thing, and this is what really reminds me a lot of X-Wing, is the pilot action. This is where in X-Wing you do things like focus or evade, you know, crap like that. Uh, very similar here, when you get done with all this, so shoot, burn advantage, move. So after you've moved, you can choose to shoot again, which would be under the same rules over here, out maneuvering, which is you're going to compare your pilot skill to reduce an enemy's advantage level by one. That has to do with if your pilot skill is higher than the opponent plane, 
you can basically declare and they lose one advantage level. If it's the same, uh, then there's a roll off to determine whether or not. And if you're a lower pilot skill, then you actually can't do that to them. And the other thing you can do as a pilot action is to climb. So this is what I was talking about previously with increasing your advantage level by one. This is the big choice you're going to have to make at the end of a play, uh, plane's activation to determine, do I want to go earlier? Do I want to give up a shot now, you know, shooting at neutral so I can be advantaged in the following turn and go first? Is that going to be more advantageous to me? Maybe there's someone who's coming in on your six, and if you let them go first, there's a good chance they're going to have a really good shot on you. And you don't want to get someone tailing because there is penalties if someone's tailing you in this game. Uh, so you do need to take the chance to climb to get into a better position. This game is all, all about the positioning. It's not just where your plane is on the board but at what advantage level. I really like that aspect of this game because that simulates so well into how dogfights would really go on. It's not just where you are specifically, but your height and your speed that's gonna help with the dogfight. And this is a good way to simulate that. So uh, like I said, end of the activation, you'll place that token to show it's taking its turn and it does have your test uh, down here to the right. Uh, just like I was talking earlier, shooting test, skill plus whatever number, dice, and you're looking for the, uh, the spades. And then it talks about the critical hits and it applies a negative one to the number of dice. Uh, retention test, we'll get into that uh, when we start playing the game and they start taking some of these tests. Uh, one more thing they do show on the back of the rule book, some pictures, handy little pictures on how things, well, not the rule book, clear it, uh, how things work. Boom. That's your movement. That's how it works. Turning, diving, shooting, deflection shot, because that's shooting at the side rather than the, uh, the back of the plane that matters. It changes things up a little bit. Head on attack, uh, tailing, which we talked about earlier, uh, wingman effect, which actually stipulates that you can't tail if you're actually in an enemy's line of sight. So um, in this one, this guy would be tailing this one, but he can't tail him and have that effect take place because he's in someone else's arc. So it simulates the fact that planes would cover each other. He's not as in good a position as he could be slotted in on a six because he has someone slotted in on him. And then uh, showing the uh, maneuver thing where you could actually turn up to 180 degrees. Now I know it's taken me a little while to talk about all this, but that's the gist of the game. It's really, really uh, not that hard. It is simple to learn and get playing. So what we are going to do is we're gonna have three Spitfires. I'm going to have them start over there and we're going to have three ME 109s. We'll roll to see what advantage level and everything that they start at. I might spread them out a little bit, you know, have them something like that, you know, see how they work, get some of these cloud covers involved, have all that good stuff going on and have them fly in and just play a couple of rounds, letting you guys see how the maneuvering is going to work and how it works with uh, the advantage level because the advantage level is the big thing to this. And then after we played a couple of rounds, uh, we'll talk about how well it's uh, solos as a game. All right. And one other little thing I wanted to show you guys before signing off here is one more little plane. This is a Hawker Hurricane that I haven't painted yet. And I know you're going, okay, well, Gimpy, where'd you get that one? Because this is supposed to only come with uh, 109s and Spitfires. I actually made this one. This is a 3D printed hurricane. And I think that's kind of neat is you can expand your game in different ways. Uh, it is uh, questionable on whether or not uh, that's kind of okay as far as copyrights are concerned, but I did want to show you guys that that is available. The planes aren't quite as good. They're not quite as detailed and you do have to kind of worry about adjusting the size a little bit, but I did try it fit on the base, so it would uh, uh, would work on that. I might paint it up later just to see how it works. Nowhere near the detail on the bottom, 
but fairly decent detail on the top and it does look like a hurricane. I saw a few on uh, Thingiverse website. There were uh, Stukas and Hurricanes and I think a Lightning was on there as well. So there are a few different uh, aircraft there. I think personally speaking, the professional ones, these, the ones that you can buy are better. They're a uh, sturdier quality plastic. The resin is fine. I mean, sturdy enough, but this is a hell of a lot more fragile, especially the thin pieces like the tail and the rudder. Uh, you can see actually this one chipped off at the back. Uh, the rudder did, if you guys can see that. Yeah, right there. So they do not hold together quite as well as these plastic pieces do. These are very, very, very durable. I think a little bit easier to paint, but just, uh, just something to show you. Just another way you might be able to expand your game, uh, maybe create some <laughs> aircraft that aren't available in the, uh, the expansions. Just a thought, thought I'd show you guys that. All right, but anyway, stay tuned. We are gonna pick up with the next video and show the actual gameplay itself, see who's going to win between our ME109s and our Spitfires. And for this game, it's basically whoever gets four boom tokens hit onto their opponent first is gonna win. So we'll see how it plays out. You guys take care, I'll see you in the next one.